the night of my, the night before my graduation day. Mm -hmm. Um, it was the worst night of the four years of my degree. Like, the university was tough because it was it was a lot for me mentally. Um, I wasn't very strong mentally at that point because um, I had nothing to stand on. So mm -hmm. I crumbled really easily at like the slightest of things. But there was a lot going on. There was like change and like transitions and all this different stuff made life tough. So uni was hard. It was hard. Um, and again, putting up with like racism mm -hmm. and like sexism. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't, oh, it wasn't yeah. fun. On today's show, I sit down with a young lady called Rihanna Davis. And she has an amazing, incredible story. At one point in her life, she was drifting away from God to a point where she even doubted his existence. But you know what? We worship an awesome and an amazing God who doesn't give up on people. He stretched out his hand, reached out to Rihanna and turned her life around. Now she's studying to be a soul winner in the mission field and she's studying at Wima Institute. So I'm looking forward to my discussion, sharing it with you, of course, with Rihanna Davis. But before we do that, let's get the important thing out of the way. If you haven't followed us, subscribed, comment, like, all that good stuff, please do so that we can keep on producing programs like this. You know, uh, one of the things that a lot of people struggle with, or the people that have gone to be atheists, is a misunderstanding of um, God's love yeah. or the lack thereof according to their understanding yeah. and their minds. So uh, how has that been in your life? Like how, how do you understand God's love? Have yeah. you seen it in your life? I think we all struggle to understand God's love. And I think when you haven't experienced love the way that you were meant to, it can be really hard to conceive of a God who loves you. Because what we do as humans is we we map what we understand. We map things we can't understand or things that we do understand, mm -hmm. right? Like it's really difficult to conceive of the solar system. But when you make like a little diagram of it and you have, you know, like in school, you make your little like functioning system of the, the planets. You're like, mm -hmm. oh, okay, like it's this big. And, but we can't conceive of things that are really big. We have to make them smaller for us to understand them or put them onto things that we understand. Mm -hmm. Like a, a ball of foil isn't a planet, but that helps us to make sense of what a planet is, right? Uh -huh. And I think in a really same, a really similar way, we map what we can't understand of God onto what we can understand of people. Because That's God true. is a person, right? God mm -hmm. is a, he's a, he's a being. Mm -hmm. And so when we can't understand him as an entity, we look around for, for things to map onto God. And so when we hear the thing of like, God is love, mm -hmm. The issue is not God, it's how we understand love. Because if I don't understand what love is, I can't conceive of a God of love. That's because right. I, all I, what I do then is I map what I see as love back onto God. And that's not what God is. Mm -hmm. So like, I'll give you an example. If your parents, like when you were a child, you know, you get in trouble and they're upset with you and they tell you off and then they they're kind of a little bit cold with you for a little while. You know, you've upset them, like they're not very pleased with you and you feel like you have to do something to, do something to earn to, back to their earn, favor, Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so for you, I mean, the punishment was just, you know, you did something that wasn't good. They punished you accordingly. And now you have to deal with the consequences of your actions. Right. You've asked for forgiveness. They said they forgive you, but they're cold with you a little bit. So what happens is when you hear that God forgives you, you map the same thing onto that. Mm -hmm. You say, okay, he forgives me for my sins. Like I've asked for forgiveness. He's but forgiven me, to do but I have to do something to earn his favor back. Mm. So what we do, what as human beings, what we do cannot be understated towards others is like being super critical in our conception of who and what God is to us. Because if I only ever see a narrow love or a, constrained love or a, a a love that demands something from me mm -hmm. then i assume that's what is meant by god is love that god is his love is narrow it's constrained it demands something from me and so i think the issue with with how we conceive of the notion of like is god loving it's not who god is it's what we think love is that's the issue at the core of it our understanding of love right yeah 
That, that is a very, very good point mm. because our understanding of love, that's what we project in everything that we right. do. Either God or other people as well because we are taking our definition and that's what we are expecting as well. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> what you others. expect. That's yeah. how we treat others. It's what we expect from others. Exactly. And so because God is a person, we're created in his image. We're like, okay, that's him. Mm -hmm. So we reflect the wrong way around. We're like, we reflect this onto him rather than him onto this. So rather than making him the standard for love, we make him a reflection of what we understand to be love, which is the, the core of the issue. And I think that has been the defining factor in my journey with God, like him shifting massively, like paradigm shifts of mm -hmm. how I understand love to be. And that has reformed how I understand him to be. Okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad you say that because I was going to ask you that you had this understanding that you have just explained since you were a kid, you never had doubts, you never had anything. So it just continued to grow from conception. You had this perfect understanding of no, God's love. of course not. Of <laughs> course not. No, no. I, I mean, I was raised Adventist, like third generation, mm -hmm. um, parents were Adventist, grandparents were Adventist. And I think I had what I best understood at that point to be a relationship with God. How did that look like? It was just doing. It was just, you know, like I go to church, do I sing my songs, I do, do my verses. verses. Exactly. Like Sabbath school, says, like choir. Amen, you right. You're right. And you're like, yeah, daughter. like I did it. I did it. <laughs> and everyone yeah. is proud of you. Exactly. And you're proud of yourself too. Yeah, you're like, exactly. yeah, like God must be pleased with me now. Right. Mm -hmm. Like he must be pleased. I'm doing good things. You know, I'm being applauded by church members. Like I'm the kid who, I was a very precocious kid. Like I was the one who was always involved, who was always, I always had an opinion about something. I was always sharing with my opinions of like adults. Mm -hmm. um, I was a very annoying child at church. I was that kid. You know, there was that like one kid at church. You were just like, please, that was me. That was me. <laughs> um, but that was the, for me, it was about earning God's favor. It was about like doing everything I could to be loved and that was like that has been the theme of my life i say that like i'm super old like i'm 24 i'm not that old but um yeah but you have had some experiences yeah 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 and the theme of my life to this point has been working for love and it's funny because i i i'd like to tell my story through the story of somebody else which mm -hmm. is anyways yeah, because um, we all have Bible characters right. that we identify with. And um, my yeah. Bible character I identify with the most is Joseph. Nice. Yeah. Because well, not nice, but <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. solid. <laughs> yeah. So nice I'll, I'll tell you the reason why. Yeah, yeah, please, because please. I, I came um, from Zimbabwe to the United States mm -hmm. in 2015. So I was just by myself, no relatives here. Mm. I didn't know anyone. So that's the most part that I identify with. Yeah. But when I came to this country, uh, coming from my country, I had some issues with uh, the, the church and the elders that mm. were from my church. And I felt like I was persecuted for yeah. something that I really, uh, it didn't need that kind of reaction they had. Right. So it's kind of like that story where Joseph had his brothers yeah. and, and he sold. So when I left, I was like, I'm going to prove to you that I'm yeah. going to be successful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's not what Joseph said. But no. in his his uh, his journey, mm. it, it ended up uh, God proving that everything that Joseph was doing whilst he had his brothers and everything, and it was something that, would later prove to them to them and his parents as well that God was in everything that he was doing. So yeah. so that's why I identify with it. Yeah. Not that I am a perfect person like like I don't think he was perfect. He wasn't perfect. But Joseph there's no recorded perfect. non sin of uh, of Joseph in the Bible mm. uh, except at the end uh where he kind of was mad uh, at his father why he cross blessed his kids. Uh -huh. <laughs> but but yeah. So I understand when you say you 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 have a Bible character that you can relate to, yeah. that you'd like to weave your story through so that yeah. you can have a Bible link in there. Yeah. So the reason that I, I didn't even pick her, God gave her to me, right? Well, we, went, okay. we went for a walk one day, um, went for a walk on campus and took my Bible with me because God was like, take your Bible. I was like, okay, took my Bible. 
and I was planning to go and you know pray and read and I had a I had a question in my mind mm -hmm. and I was like okay I'm gonna read about this thing I'm gonna read about this story I'm gonna read about this person and I sat down to read like I'm on this rock in like the middle of nowhere I sit down to read my bible and um I pray and the Holy Spirit says read about Jacob and Leah oh and I was like Huh. Leah, you, you don't mean Rachel, like <laughs> you, <laughs> Jacob and Leah, like Leah, because Leah is a figure that no one really cares about. Leah, like yeah. that's kind of the thing. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be told you're Leah, you yeah, know, because of the description. Well, of so many how, things, yeah. so many things about her that you're just like, I don't want to, I don't want to be her, right? And Rachel is the one that we you know was favored, like she was loved, she had Joseph, mm -hmm. um, so it was like. The point I was at with God, I was like, I don't understand because I was, I was still trying to make sense of his love and love in my life, what it looks like now. And I couldn't, I was like, God, are we sure? He was like, Rihanna, open your Bible, read about Jacob and Leah. So I started to read about Jacob and Leah. And honestly, the whole experience was amazing. Reading about this was amazing, but it was so powerful. I'm going to open my Bible. This is my very, very old Bible. I got it when I was, it's a Bible for teens. I got it when I was 14. Oh, um, and I haven't even using it for the past like year, but it's, it's one of my favorite, my favorite things <laughs> ever. Like if I lost this, I don't know what I would do. Anyway, so we start in Genesis 29, right? And um, this is where Jacob meets Rachel and then marries both the sisters. Um, and so we meet Leah um, in verse, 16 and she's mentioned only because of rachel it says like now laban had two daughters this is the new king james mm -hmm. the name of the elder was leah and the name of the younger was rachel 17 leah's eyes were delicate but rachel was beautiful of form and appearance um and then we don't see leah again for like a couple of verses until the whole marriage thing and i think when i was reading this it was so powerful because it was like Growing up as a child, like I'm the oldest sister, mm -hmm. um, eldest sister. And I was, I've always been a very outgoing, loud, expressive person, but I felt invisible for a lot of my, my life. Mm. I felt unseen, like growing up as a black girl in the UK mm -hmm. was not easy. Um, growing up as a bold, outspoken girl in church was not easy. <laughs> That's right. That's and right. so in many ways, as much as people might have thought that I was very like there, I felt very invisible. Like I didn't feel seen. Mm. Um, and nobody really saw me like properly, you know? Um, people saw what they wanted to see of me or they saw like versions of me, but right, they didn't right. see who I was at my core, which was like this little girl who desperately wanted to be loved, mm. you know? Um, yeah, and so, I mean, the story continues, like, I mean, I have a sister, like I said, I have a, a younger sister, and praise God, nobody's compared how we look, because that would have been a whole thing. Okay. But we're very different people. Mm -hmm. um, in many, many ways, we're very different people. And so there was always a thing of comparison between us, of like, you know, she's this, you're this, she's this, you're this. And that made me feel like I had to kind of always strive to be either better, not that my sister, but better than something, this invisible competition, mm -hmm. or just give up trying. So it was like that to, that kind of dichotomy of like, I either strive or I stop. I see, yeah. I see, I see. Yeah, I, I see it a lot in a, in a lot of families, how people compare siblings. Yeah. Like, oh, or if they know a sibling, one of the siblings first, yeah. they have this kind of, experience with them they have an expectation that yeah when they meet the other sibling they're they'll gonna be, be the, the same way <laughs> and the thing like, i remember i was talking to my sister about this the other day when we had like parents evening at school mm -hmm. um teachers would uh be shocked that she's my sister because i was not i was a you, good student no i was i did good in my exams but i was not a good student like i was talking and annoying and disruptive Mm -hmm. And they were always like, your sisters? Like, she's such a pleasure to have in class. <laughs> <laughs> but no you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think it was that thing of, yeah, comparison was, was the thief of joy. Mm. And obviously we see Leah in relation to her sister. We don't see her as her own person. She's like, 
She was this, but Rachel was this. Rachel was beautiful. So whatever Leah was, whether we, however we want to pass the translation and like, mm -hmm. you know, be like, that's what it meant. Like the point is that she was in opposition to her sister, that she was not whatever Rachel was. Right. Rachel right. was beautiful. Rachel was lovely. Leah was not. Mm -hmm. And so we disappear, she disappears again for like a couple of verses. And we see Jacob backing and forthing and, you know, like Laban says to Jacob, like, there's this rule that we have, like, you know, later on after the, the deceit, he says, like, we have a rule where mm -hmm. the oldest has to marry first and then the younger can get married. But we see in this immediately how Jacob says to Laban, give me Rachel. And Laban's like, sure. And imagine how it would have felt for Leah as somebody who knew that her only chance of marriage was her sister being married because she wasn't pretty. That's how we meet her. She's yeah, not, the, she's the ugly, is clear, right? Yeah. It says she's not pretty. Mm -hmm. And because Rachel has to be married, because Rachel probably had many admirers and many people who wanted to marry her because of how beautiful and lovely she was. You have this sense that like Leah's safeguard is Rachel's beauty. Mm. Somebody has to marry her because people want to marry Rachel. Somebody has to marry her. Mm -hmm. So then when Jacob comes along and then says, I'll have Rachel, that disappears. The, the hope that she had of being loved by right. somebody mm -hmm. disappears. Um, and I think the saddest thing for me is them getting married. Like it says, obviously that um, in verse 23, so this is after the wedding. Mm -hmm. Now it came to pass in the evening of the wedding that he took Leah, Laban, took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob and he went into her. Um, I'm gonna to skip to verse 25. So it came to pass in the morning that behold, it was Leah. And he, Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? I'm gonna stop there. So Leah is so desperate to be loved that she will do anything for love, including deceiving somebody, mm -hmm. right? Because she's seen, we've, we, we skip a lot in this story, right? Like it's seven years that he works for Rachel. So you would imagine that Leah is watching him day in, day out for seven years. And he's, you know, he's probably brooding. Like he's got a lot going on emotionally. He's like this kind of dark, broody, probably handsome, ruddy guy, right? Right, right. And right. he's in love with her sister. Mm -hmm. She's the eldest. But you would imagine that there would be some kind of affection towards him because, you know, sometimes guys come along and you're like, ah, oh, like, it's kind of nice. Yeah. And seven yeah. years in his vicinity, like hearing him speak, seeing him work, like you'd imagine there was something, some kind of thing there. And we mm -hmm. see this later on because we see that she clearly wants to be loved by Jacob. So she's developing over the seven years, this affection for him, right? Even though she knows he's, she's, he's not gonna marry her. Mm -hmm. And like, we don't know when exactly Laban comes in and says like, hey, marry um, Jacob. But she does it because she's, the way I understood it, the way that I was reading it and the way that um, it felt was like she thought that the only way that she could get love was by deceiving her way into it. Yeah, and probably on the, uh, on the other side as well, we can, we can give her a benefit of a doubt that she might have just succumbed to the pressure. No, exactly. Because I, I, I probably would agree with you that she might have felt that way. But you know that not everything that we feel, uh, we get an opportunity to exercise our feelings. It's true. Yeah, she might have felt that way, but it that pressure came probably on top of those feelings yeah. that, hey, um, Laban is playing the culture card. He's playing the I'm the dad card. Mm -hmm. And all these pressures are on her. Right. Plus probably her feelings yeah. towards him. So I'm just I'm I'm just layering some of the yeah, yeah, some yeah. of the layers that yeah, might no, have complicated sure. the situation a little bit more. I remember reading about this in Patriarchs and Prophets. Mm -hmm. um, Ellen White says that the way in which Leah had deceived Jacob meant that he could never love her. Mm. So in her efforts to be loved, the lengths that she went to, whether she was entirely on her like entirely of her own volitional world that was pressured, like it likely was both, right? Yeah. Um, the lengths that she went to, to get that love, precluded her from that love to begin with. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a big part of my story in that 
the ways I sought to find love meant that I couldn't find love. Like I, the way that I think I, I am as a person and I have been for quite some time is that I think I have to give love to get love. Mm. Like it's transactional. Like if I do enough things, eventually you'll have to love me. Like if I, if I, and we see this with Leah later on, like we see this in a second, but like if I love you enough, if I do enough things, if I make enough grand gestures, mm -hmm. like I was thinking this morning, actually, it's funny, I was thinking about this guy, like when I was like, I don't know, 16. And I, I liked him. I thought he liked me. We were talking for a little bit, but anyway, that's, that was a child, like, you know. Right, right. But um, I remember writing him like a story about like imaginary characters that were based on me and him. Mm -hmm. And it, it was really corny, obviously, like I was 16, I was, I was like, oh, brother. <laughs> like, but I think it was a thing of like, if I do this, maybe you'll know what I want and you'll do it for me. Like I wanted to be writing a story about me, mm -hmm. but he didn't do it. So I had to write it for him. You know, that kind of thing. It was like, I had to give love to get love. I had to show them like, love me like this by loving them like that mm -hmm. and in the hopes that they would love me like that. Um, and I think we see that with Leah here, right? Like she's, she's like, hey, love me like this. Right, right. And right. Jacob can't yeah. because he doesn't love because her. He, yeah, he, he doesn't, yeah, he doesn't love he doesn't her love that her. way. Yeah, right. probably he might have like a agape love for a sister right. in law to be. Right, but, but it, it probably wasn't anything that was like, I exactly. want to marry you. And exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. Uh, did you ever experience this in your in your childhood, where uh, what you've just described, uh, you, you were looking for love in different places and different people, but ending up being disappointed, not finding that same yeah. love. I mean, obviously, the things, the ways that I looked for love changed as I grew older. So, in mm -hmm. childhood, it was a lot of like looking for love in um, books. I read a lot as a kid. Okay. And so finding love was like finding love in, finding space and comfort in imaginary families and people mm. and characters, like finding a lot of my sense of self and peace and safety in fictional worlds. Okay. Um, How old were you? That would have been between like you know, seven and like 16. And 16, okay. Yeah. So like it was a good, good number of years of me seeking to feel belonging in these fictional worlds. And the thing is like, it worked for as long as the book was being read. And then the book but ended and then, you know, I had, to keep, I had to keep reading it and reading it to simulate that feeling constantly of being loved, of being part of this world where I wasn't an onlooker. I felt like I belonged and I was mm -hmm. really just swallowed up in these worlds that were, were being created. Um, and they were, book characters were family, they were friends, they were people that I could, you know, that I was like, oh yeah, like she gets me, he gets me. And it, it sounds sad, cause mm -hmm. it is kind of sad, but I think it's a thing of like, just you're looking for it in places that it, it doesn't always make sense. Like we see, Le she knows he loves her, si she, he loves her sister. She knows he loves Rachel, right? Seven years, he's been working for Rachel. Right. But there's still that thing of like, maybe I'll find love here. You know, mm. like it's still the thing of like, you mm -hmm. know, they're not real characters. You know, they're just people that others have written. They don't even exist. They're, they're like, they're words. They're not even people. They are literally words. Right, right. But that's the, the magic, I suppose, of, of, of fiction, of books, is that it's so enrapturing that you can be swept up in this fantasy of like, they're real and I'm going to find love from that, that like, you know full well you can't, but it feels like you might be able to. Yeah, and the other thing is, um, I'll take the analogy of uh, wholesome food and fast food or mm. this bad food. You may feel full in that moment. Right. But it doesn't last long. Exactly. Yeah. And it's not, the, the fullness you get isn't a meaningful fullness. Mm -hmm. Right? Like you feel, I loved reading books. So I would read, I, I read like hundreds of books a year. Mm -hmm. Um because I just read every day, every week I was reading another book because it was like when one ends, you can't have a gap between that book ending and reality again. So you read another one. You just keep reading. You just keep right? reading so that you can stay in that world. Right. I see. And you have fictional friends and fictional boyfriends and fictional, because it's just like, 
it's why, an why can't world. you? Exactly. Yeah. It, you, life is what you make it in your mind, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. As a kid. So reading these characters and being like, they love me or I love them was a way of feeling safe. Oh, I can identify with them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Or like, they're just like me. Exactly. Yeah, like, exactly. exactly. So besides books, yeah. what are the things um, did you find like, I'm fine, I'm, I'm getting to where I find love, but then you, you let us saw that uh, they were not the real deal. I think friendship, because um, again, that was what I was really in my like, I give love to get love. Mm -hmm. But I thought I just have to like give, 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 give. And so like as a kid, being friends was me giving constantly. Mm -hmm. Like I will love you to the ends of the earth. Even if you never return it in the same way, like I, I have the hope that one day, you will love me the way that I want you to. It's a mm. thing of like, it's wishful thinking. Right. Like, right. even if you're being mean to me, I'm going to hold on because maybe one day you're going to like change. Mm. Um, and I think, yeah, yeah. I think that was the, the image of, of trying to earn love. And I, I want to hop back into the story here because so chap, ver, chapter 29 is still on verse 31. I was gonna. Um, I was gonna ask oh, this sorry, before, go before you, yes, before go you ahead. read. Um, at this point, how did you view God? Yeah, I think because we're, we're like I said at the beginning, mm -hmm. the view that we have of love is what we map onto God. Yeah. So, however we understand love to be, when people say God is love, that's what we hear. Mm -hmm. God is fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. And because I'd spent so long believing that I couldn't be loved, I've been told that by my childhood bullies you know mm -hmm. who made me hate the color of my skin and my brain my mind the things that I did like how I looked things that are like fundamental to who you are as a person right things that shape your your character your being because I was so um shaken in that I didn't feel like I was lovable and I felt like to be lovable I had to earn love, and that love. right like mm -hmm. I had to always be different do something different and so growing up, I, always, I saw God in the same lens. It was the same focus mm -hmm. of like, I have to prove that I can be loved. I have to, like Leah, deceive my way into being loved. So did you do the same thing with God? Yeah, I, I, I was always, like I said, I was always doing stuff in church. Mm -hmm. I was always involved in something. It was like, I was the, the little Pharisee in training, you know, like people were on their phones during Sabbath. And I was like, um, <laughs> we're in the sanctuary. Like it's Sabbath, have some respect. Did you say you know? little Pharisee in training? Yeah, little Pharisee in training, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> this is my first time hearing that. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I want to do good. And I want God to know that I don't approve of that. Like okay. what, what he's doing, he's scrolling. That's not me. You know, I'm just listening to the servers really, you know, that kind of thing of like, mm -hmm. of trying to prove to God, like, I'm a good child and they're not good. And I know that's not good. I don't endorse that mm. kind of thing of being like, see, like, I, I get it. I get you. Like, I'm doing it right. Right, right, right. right. Um, and that was the, I think, as I'm telling the story, I'm realizing that like, it might seem like I'm talking about myself in terms of like, oh, my life. But I think we really often pull apart God from our lives. We're like, okay, this is my mental health, this is my emotional well-being, and that's God. And they're very linked mm. because my mental well-being can't be stable or healthy without a stable picture of who God is, right? Mm -hmm. And God can't be stable in my mind until I understand what these things are and how I fit into the world and how he's created me to be which is through seeing his love. And so it's like this thing of like, you can't pull them apart. You can't say, okay, this is how I am psychologically, this is how I'm spiritually. They're linked. They're intrinsically linked. You can't mm -hmm. pull them apart. Um, and so searching for love wasn't a thing of like, oh, that's your life and there, where's God? Like, no, that was God. Searching for love was looking for God without me realizing it and without me being aware of that as, as consciously as I am now, but searching for love was searching for God and that that searching made everything else destabilized mm. because without that foundation nothing else everything else crumbles right so did you ever get to a point where you're like I don't want anything to do with God he is not a loving God at all yes 
and I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back in now because I feel oh, like this yeah, is the yeah, bit I'm where for, this is that's a good that's a really good segue actually. Yeah. So verse 31 says, When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, which I thought was really sad, mm-hmm. he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And so first of all, like she's invisible, right? But not to God. Like God sees Leah as unloved. Mm-hmm. He says, Leah, Jacob doesn't love you, but I love you. So he gives her children, right? And then this is amazing. Not good, amazing, bad, amazing. So she has a son and she calls him Reuben. And it says here in verse 32, she calls him Reuben for she said, the Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. So her first child is her, because Reuben literally means look, a son, right? It's her offering right, right. to Jacob, like, look, now I'm worthy to be loved, mm-hmm. right? Like, look, that's, that's, that's you know, little Farrah training Rihanna, like being like, look, God, good works. Right, look, I've done something, right, like, look, right. now I can be your child. Now you can love me, right? But it doesn't work, obviously, because he doesn't love her, right? Mm-hmm. And so she has another child. Um, and she says, 33, but because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. Um, and Simeon, um, his second son, means heard, right? And then she has another child. And she says, now this time, my husband will become attached to me because I have <laughs> borne him three sons. And she calls him Levi, which means attached. Mm-hmm. And we see in these three sons that desperation that she has to be seen and loved she's like maybe if i just try hard enough and the thing is like she's presenting these sons to jacob as a as proof of the fact that she can be loved right but right. she's not saying that they the, the existence of the sons is proof that they are that she is loved because god gave them to her because she was unloved yeah so she's using the things she's like these are the things that i have to prove but it's like no 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 they are the proof they are the proof that you are loved Mm -hmm. leah but she doesn't see she's like this is what i'm gonna use to get love right and so what happens is i think we see this thing of like in our lives and my life i know like i was blessed by god in many ways but i used those things to earn earn love love. like god Mm -hmm. blessed me with an with an intellect with a brain like i love studying i love reading and thinking right he gave me that gift and i was like okay maybe if i work really really hard Mm -hmm. people will like my brain and how i think and they'll be like you're so clever right 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 as like that would be proof if i just work really hard and get good grades then like i'll be loved my parents will love me my family will love me whoever will love me right teachers will love me and then the thing of like the way that i am as a person like i'm a very creative person like i said i'm i love drawing i love writing i love all that kind of stuff and then using those things again to get love like if i write really well if i write good (laughs) stories if i write these books and people love me like so all the things that he gave to me Mm -hmm. as evidence of his love for me i used to try and gain love from Mm. others that was already there in my face right can we safely say that is a that's a form of insecurity of course it is absolutely yeah so you know i used to think that insecurity or insecurities who often manifest themselves in being reserved like hey i'm insecure so i'm not gonna say anything right so it's recently i just had this light bulb moment Mm. that someone can be insecure and want to be the smartest in the room like hey i'm just gonna jump in first so that everyone will be able to respect me or will be able to notice me exactly and like i'm a very confident person Mm -hmm. um or at least i i presented confidently so people were like oh like she's yeah she's she's cool yeah but it was obviously like a deep insecurity like at its core it was just this like this fear of like what if nobody loves me Right. What if not? Like we see with Leah, right? Three sons. Mm -hmm. Now he'll love me. Now he'll love me. Now he'll love me. Three sons. Three sons. And she's begging him in their names. Please love me now. Like, look what I have given you. Look what I've done for you. Like Rachel has given. And this is this is even the joke because Rachel has given Jacob nothing. Yeah. But his love for her is not shifted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the love that we get is not dependent on from god it's not dependent on what we do or even who we are the love we get is because he loves us Mm. right Mm -hmm. and i love how this passage ends because that the tragedy of those three sons and the begging and then she has one more son and something shifts i don't know what shifts but something shifts because it says and she conceived again and bore a son and she said now i will praise the lord therefore she called his name judah which means praise then she stopped bearing and i was like wow like she's struggling and striving for the love of jacob Mm -hmm. for these three sons 
look, a son, heard, attached. And finally she says, you know what? I am loved. I have three sons, now a fourth. Mm -hmm. Now I'll praise God. And the, the word she uses, the name she uses for God here is Jehovah. She's using his covenant name, right? Jehovah, right, right. like the creator God who is all powerful and mighty and who can speak and things become like she's recognizing who God is. And she's finally saying, now I will praise him because mm -hmm. I am loved. And, and we see that God opened her womb because she was unloved. Right. 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 But she now sees that she's loved. So she stops having children. So the point of the kids was for God to be like, look, please, Leah, I love you. I love you. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that like, I mean, we're going to go into the bit in a second, but like, it's not always a straightforward process to get to that point. It took Leah three sons to see that God loved her. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Like, it's not a one day thing. No. Because three sons, it's a, it's a good chunk of time. It's a lot of time. Yeah. And we don't know how long they waited between sons either, you know, like we don't know yeah, what happened between. But, or, but it's still, it's, but it's still, a long time. It's, it, it's still it's, a long time. Yeah. It's a lot of stages to get to and the thing is that that isn't even the end like she goes back into the she goes back yeah because afterwards. she she went on to give her maid to to her and, and that's the whole well. and we're gonna get that in a second but the point that you're saying here is that like when it comes to seeing god's love i think sometimes we think that once we discovered god or who he is we see his love we're like okay like everything's fixed everything's fixed the thing no, is that we journey. carry baggage with yeah. us and mm -hmm. this is why again like i'm saying it's so important to link together our mental psychological well-being and our spirituality because they're not like when we see god it's through the lenses of our experiences it's through the lenses of the journeys that we've had like when i love genesis it's a great book when god meets anybody he tells them who he is and almost never is it the same name right the name that he uses normally is the god of abraham isaac and jacob but that's mm -hmm. like later on mm -hmm. right but in this book when he's meeting abraham and isaac and jacob he doesn't say, I'm the God of Abraham. He says, I'm the God of your father, if it's applicable. Mm -hmm. And he says, I am. And he says something that makes sense to them. Yeah, in their context. Right. Yeah. Because God meets us in our mess, in our context. Not like, I am God like this God. I'm just God, like, generally for everybody. Like, mm -hmm. yes. But he tells Abraham, like, I love the promise to Abraham. I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. That's right. That's but that's right. what he tells Jacob or mm -hmm. Isaac, mm -hmm. because that's not who he is to those people. He's something else to them, but he's still God. And I think in this, we see the same thing of like, Leah is calling God by his name. She's like, this is who you are to me. To me, you are almighty. Mm -hmm. To me, you are the creator. To me, you are the covenant God who keeps his promises. Like that is who you are to me. Right. And I think when we talk about that journey with God and seeing his love, it's, we have to hold space for people to see him in different ways because we don't all see God the same way. Like they didn't see God the same way. He was different to all of these people in different ways. He was different iterations of himself to those to these people. He was the same God. He was verifiable. You know, mm -hmm. like it wasn't like he was doing different things, but the way they all saw him was different. The God of, of how Leah saw him wasn't how Rachel saw him or how mm -hmm. Jacob saw him, mm -hmm. right? But that didn't mean that he wasn't God. It meant that they all needed a certain way to see him. But for me, for my journey, and like as with Leah's, which is why Leah's so like visceral to me as an experience, is because God in the journey with Leah is a God who loves her. Mm. And it's not, a, she doesn't just believe it. Like we see there in number, like son four, she's like, okay, I believe it. But then next son, she's right back down to where she was before, right? Right. Because it's a she had to really believe that God loved her. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't just a thing of like, I believe God loves me. Like it was impacted by Jacob and by Rachel because she let it, not because it was meant to, but because she allowed it to. Like in the next passage, chapter 30, right? Rachel wants kids now. She's jealous of her sister. For the first time, Rachel is jealous of her sister, which is wild because you imagine that she was never jealous of her sister, right? Mm -hmm. But she says to Jacob, give me children or else I die, which is we see this image of her being kind of petty and like not as like kind of, I don't know, focused and solid as Leah is. Anyway, so she gives Jacob her maid and Jacob has children with her maid. And she names the two children things that indicate that she doesn't <laughs> really care about anything other than one-upping her sister. So she names the first child um, Dan, 
because she says, God has judged my case and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. What has he judged, Rachel? What, what case has he judged? Like, this isn't a competition with your sister. There's no judging. You haven't had children. You've given your maid. You've done this yourself. You see what I'm saying? It's not right, a thing of like, right. oh, he's blessed me. No, mm -hmm. you've blessed yourself. Like, this is entirely you. And then the second child she has, um, Naptali, and she says, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister <laughs> and indeed I have prevailed. So again, you see this image like Rachel isn't really. Yeah. And interestingly, the word she uses for God, the name she uses for God in verse six is Elohim. And Elohim is like the creator God, mm -hmm. right? Um, but we see later on Rachel has like an affinity for idols. Like she keeps idols. Is yeah, she? yeah. So she's not really seeing God as God, Jehovah. She's like, oh yeah, like he's God. He created things, you know, like he's God. Because the first son has God, but Natalia does not have God in his name. Mm. Right. And even with even though Leah was still focused on the wrong thing, all of her sons have they Jehovah a, uh, yeah. in their name. And they had a deep understanding of what God had done right. for her. Yeah. And it says in verse nine, when Leah saw that she'd stopped bearing, she obviously gives Jacob her, her maid, right? Mm -hmm. And she then has two sons through her maid. And neither of those children have God in their name. Mm. Asher and Gad do not have God in her name. And so she's now comparing herself and she's robbing herself of the joy because she doesn't even see who God is anymore. She's like, I'm so desperate for this love now. That love isn't enough anymore. This love that I want, forget you. And, and that's where I got to, right? It was a thing of like, I understand in theory that God loves me. Mm -hmm. But I'm not feeling it. I'm not seeing it. Like, sure, I'm alive, you know, like I'm blessed and whatever, like God loves me. But I need to feel a tangible love from people now, from others, from from the, my ambitions, my careers, whatever. Like, I need to feel that love. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we can do this anymore. Like, there's a point where you get to where it feels like God is kind of holding you back. Like he wants more from you than you can give. Because like I said, remember, for me, love was transactional. Right, I give right. to I get. Give, and then you get. That's right. So if God, God's love is the same as my love, then he gives to get. It's like, okay, Rihanna, I'm going to love you. What are you going to give me in, in return, in exchange? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I don't have much to give you. I don't really, I don't really want to give you anything, actually. <laughs> like, this was like a bit of a drain. Uh -huh. And so, you know, Leah goes from seeing God as Jehovah to not even thinking about him um, because of her pursuit of love. And I got to a point like around... I don't know, 18, 19. Um, God was like, he was there. I knew he existed. You know, I knew he was like real. I never, I didn't think I ever really doubted that he didn't exist. Mm -hmm. But it was like, you know, you can do your thing. I'll do mine. Like your love is probably good, but like it's not really working. So I'm going to find love that's more like, more my speed, more my scratch, you know? Um, I'm going to find love in things that I can tangibly feel. And that can make me f feel a certain way. Right. Yeah. And again, it's the thing of like, they're fleeting. It's, it's like pockets of love, like relationships, right. people, careers, ambitions. Like they're, they're there, but they're there in like bursts. And you have to keep searching, right? You have to keep finding and it's really mm -hmm. exhausting. But the point is, that it's like, God, your love isn't working for me. So forget so you. you. Just, he's just a distant God at yeah. this point. Like, hey, you do your thing. I'll, I'll just mind my own business right, because and we don't have interaction. I think it's a thing of like, it doesn't feel like God hears you anymore. Okay. Right, because this is when Leah saw she stopped bearing, it's like, hold up a minute. She's having kids. I've just, I, I can't have more. Like, wh what's going on? Like, what's happening here, right? Mm. And it's a thing of like, the blessings that you thought were blessings become almost curses. You know, the things that God bless you, they become curses. Like, I remember writing. I'm a, I'm a writer. God bless me with the gift of writing. And Praise the Lord. I wrote a lot of um, a lot of stuff as a kid. And as an adult, I wrote a lot of stuff too. And I was desperate to be published. Because mm. I was like, I know I'm a good writer, right? I know I was good at what I did. People commented like, this is good. This is really good. I've got it edited, whatever. But I remember being really mad with God that I wasn't being published. Because people told me, like agents, you know, like people in the publishing industry, they were like, this is good stuff. But there's always something that was like, but we're not looking for this right now. Or, but oh. we're not, you have to finish this thing or whatever. There was mm -hmm. always something that blocked me and it was never my ability. And I was like, God, what is going on? Like, 
are you blocking me? Like, are you stopping me from, mm. wh why are you, I want to be, I want to be loved. I want to be successful. I want to be good at what I do. I'm, I am good at what I do because you, right, you made me right, good at what I do. Right, right. So why aren't you, why aren't you getting involved? And I think that frustration in my creative ambitions played out through my writing. Um, like it started off kind of like, you know, mild stuff, just like you just write little, you know, whatever, fancy stuff, whatever. But eventually it was like, you know what, God, if you're not going to be involved, then fine. I'm not even going to acknowledge just, you anymore. Yeah, I'm just going to do my own I'm thing. I'm going to do my own thing. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not even going to need, I don't even need you to be involved in this process anymore. Like, you don't want me to succeed? Fine, go away. I'll write. I'll do my thing. I will write what I want to write. And you can't tell me that it's bad or no, like you're not involved anymore. You, you, you're not blessing me anymore. Mm. So you don't get a say in this anymore. Is this when you were in college or? You... Yeah, this was around like 1920. I think my writing started to shift a lot more towards just being like, huh? Ah. Because before it was things that like, things that my family would probably read and they'd be like, oh, this is, this is okay. This is nice. But there was a point where I was like, they, no one can read this stuff. You know, this isn't <laughs> going to be stuff that they're going to be. Not that it was necessarily super bad, but it was just something you wouldn't want your parents to read. <laughs> right. <laughs> that right, kind of stuff. Right, right. But the point was, it was just me being like, I don't want you anymore. Mm. Like, you're not blessing. I am barren. I've stopped bearing. Like, I don't want you to be involved anymore. Like, I will do it myself. I will give him my mate. Mm. I will do it myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was that thing of like, of, of searching that it was like, okay, I think now I have to find find it myself. I think I have to do this myself now. So did you have other other things that you're exploring? Like other people would be reading about how the world came into existence. And did you still have that connection that he is the creator God or you had your worldview quite wide and broad yeah. and all these things just flooding your mind? It and shifted. Being comfort I think I was like, if God isn't going to be the God I need him to be, uh -huh. I will find something else. Mm. So because ultimately we are all searching for something to worship, right? And we all want a way that we could understand the world and our lives, like frameworks that we can use to understand what's going on around us and in us and all the other stuff. And so there were all these questions I was like, God doesn't care. He doesn't love me. He's not a loving God for the reasons that we talked about before. So I need to find somebody that does love me. Something that is bigger than me that does love me. Mm -hmm. And I think like opening that up and being like, maybe God is God, but there's like other little gods or something was a really like appealing idea that God is almost like the superior creator God, but there are other entities or beings that like can do stuff too, you know? Mm. Um, and it sounds silly, like I'm sure people watch this and be like, what are you talking about? Like, what are you talking about? But <laughs> I mean, the thing about the enemy is that he knows what it is that we're looking for and how to like give us his suggestions to fill that, right? And he knows the timing. He knows when to start. Of course, you couldn't do that to me when I was like 12 or 16. That wouldn't have happened. But at exactly. 20, it was like, well, 21, I was like, mm, you know, maybe it's not so far-fetched. Mm -hmm. Because if God created everything, he could have created... You know, you kind of, then you start to reason your way through it. So it seems silly. You're like, oh, who would believe that? You would. If you were yeah. given the right situation, you would believe that. Yeah. I, I, I don't think that it seems silly because we have quite a, a good population of people in, on this planet that have the same belief. Yeah. That uh, believe that there is, there is a higher power which they don't acknowledge as God. Yeah, just like the, the universe. Yeah, the universe. And, right. and you can find that. Probably in any continent, yeah. people that think that these little gods that you have been saying, God of this and yeah. God of this and God of this. And it's always like it's fascinating to me that in most cases, those little gods and those alternatives, they are always mad and angry. Yes. The <laughs> yeah. little gods are never, they're Loving. never good. Yeah. Like, and I, I didn't ever like worship or like um, venerate like actively like small gods or deities mm -hmm. but it was always a thing of like what if you know like i was really into i love history that's my first degree i love history um and i read a lot about like the early my focus was early modern early modern world which is like 15th century to like 18th century okay right? um and i liked looking at the early modern caribbean so like pre-colonialism mm -hmm. before like the europeans arrived in the caribbean 
What did it look like? Who was there? What did they believe? What did they do? How did they live? Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Like, I love it. I love it. Um, but a really big thing in that whole process was this thing of like, like you're saying, like if God is, is, is love, if God is real, if God is there, why did they all die? Like, why did they get massacred? <laughs> yeah. Why did they lose their mm -hmm. cultures and their languages? Like, why did they lose their land? Because surely they were the oppressed. They were the minorities and God was just like, well, it's okay. Like do what you want with them. I don't care. Mm. And so it became really easy to believe in this God that didn't really care or didn't really get involved. He was like, oh, do your thing. Like atrocities, no big deal. Do your thing. And that was a really tragic image that I had of God of like, he doesn't care. And I think through the doubts that I had engendered from the beginning of that period of like, I'll do my thing now. Like, you, you know, do your thing. It was really easy for those thoughts of like, he doesn't care. He's not real. He's not, well, he's real, but he's not there. He's got other people to do these things mm -hmm. for him. Like he's got, he's, he's holding up the world. He's, holding, he's probably going to send like other things to do stuff if you need something or he can still speak to you, but like through other ways, you know, like through tarot and through like crystals and whatever, because like, it was like, I, I didn't even feel like I could approach God anymore. Because mm. remember, I learned that you give to get. Right, right. Right. And so if I haven't been giving for how many years, I can't get anything. Mm. <laughs> so I can't even ask him. I have to like, okay, let me ask my tarot cards because like maybe God will answer me through that because like it's not him, but it's like indirect. So you know what I mean? That's right. So at this point, were you still going to church or you're like? I think I stopped going to church around like 20, 1920. And it wasn't like a, it wasn't like an immediate pulling away of like, I'm never going back. It was just like a, a gradual drift where one day I was just like, oh, I'm just I've been for stay. a few, mm -hmm. I've been for a few months, you know? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't a thing of like, I've left it. I looking back, I left at 19, but I didn't think that I'd left okay. because I was like, I'm not like partying or I don't know, like yeah. doing the bad stuff or something. Mm -hmm. So like, it's still kind of, Still kind of okay. Like when you go back home, you still go to yeah, church. Yeah, exactly. And like I go with my family, I go with my, my grandma, my aunt, whatever. But mm -hmm. it wasn't a thing of like, this is, it, it, it fallen out of being the tradition that it was. Like obviously for me, that point in church was a ritual. You go every Sabbath. Right. But it stopped being that at some point. Mm. It was just like, it's Sabbath, but I'm going to be in my room or I'm going to go see my friends. Because like, it's not going out or watching a show, but like, <laughs> I'm just with friends. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to do anything what, crazy. Exactly. <laughs> My friends weren't like, they were respectful of Sabbath in how I explained it to them, but it was explained to them as like restrictions. Mm. I don't do this. I don't do this. I don't do this. I don't do this. So, you know, they, they know that like when Rihanna comes over, we can't watch this. That mm. was always like, we can't do this. I see. We can't do this. We'll just hang out and talk. But we could talk about anything, obviously. Like, we could talk about anything, but we can't watch a show. We can't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about the show, but we can't watch it, you know? Yeah. I see, I see. Yeah, it's it's interesting that there are some things that stay at the back of your mind. Yeah. How, how you are raised. But at this moment, as we, as we are discussing, yeah. uh, we we often miss the core of... Uh, uh, of what we do because yeah. the center of everything should be Christ. Right. And then we are left with all these traditions that we are at the back of our mind. And, you know, our mind is playing games with us mm. because you're being guilty by the enemy saying, hey, if you do this, you're going to be the worst person. Right. <laughs> but you can go so far. But he keeps on he keeps uh, moving the moving, boundary. <laughs> moving the boundary. Yeah. Like, OK, you did this the other day. It wasn't Might as well just do that now. Yeah, like, you just, just keep going. Like, it's like, <laughs> you're not as bad as this other person. Right. Because like, look at what they're doing. But <laughs> exactly. you're just like talking about a show on Sabbath. Like, it's fine. That's probably fine, yeah, right? Exactly. As you said, you're not, you're not partying, you know, you know yeah. all these bad things. Exactly. So, um, we, we're we linking with the story of Leah, of, of course, but yeah. I, I'm curious, how did that last? Did that, uh, where you are right now, where we are in the, in your journey, mm. did that last throughout college or you had a point where you started feeling like, man, I've drifted really far. I, I, I need to get my life where I can have a strong footing or I can, I can have a solid ground. I remember... The night of the night before my graduation day, mm -hmm. um, it was the worst night of the four years of my degree. Like, the university was tough because it was it was a lot for me mentally. Um, I wasn't very strong mentally at that point because um, I had nothing to stand on. So mm -hmm. I crumbled really easily at like the slightest of things. But there was a lot going on. There was like change and like transitions and all this different stuff made 
life tough. So uni was hard. It was hard. Um, and again, putting up with like racism, mm -hmm. and, like sexism, mm -hmm. like it wasn't, oh, it wasn't yeah. fun. Yeah. Um, and having to feel like I had to prove, like I went to like a, a university where there was loads of people who were richer than me and um, thought they were better than me because of their wealth or their race or their gender. And so I always felt the need to prove to them like I was as good as them. Because right, again, the thing right, of like, right. talking about like insecurity, mm -hmm. Leah, like I have to show you that I can do what you do and better. And it wasn't even a matter of like, it was true or it wasn't. It was a thing of like, so what, Rihanna? Like, so what if you're better than them? So what if they're better than you? But it was this thing of like, because I, like I said, I felt invisible from childhood. I was like, I have to prove to somebody that I matter, that I'm lovable, that I'm worthy of whatever it is that I'm looking for, right? That love, that affection. Because for me, love is, for me, love is, affirmation for me love is appreciation mm, mm. and that includes you know like how i think how i am how i look how i walk like all the things about me that make me me mm -hmm. for me those things being appreciated for me feels like being loved and so it's like if i put it in front of your face you have to appreciate me you have to love me if i if i deceive you into marriage you have to love me right <laughs> you have to you, right. you, it's like this really strong arm like policy of like if i just force you to see me mm -hmm. you will have to love me right. but that's not how right. it works right right and so because of all of that backing and forthing at university and that desire to to strive and be seen and be heard and all this other stuff it it crumbled the night before I was graduating, like everything was like up in the air. My family had all caught COVID, other than my parents. Hmm. Um, and the, none of them could come. My mom, my, my sister couldn't come, my best friend in the whole entire world, she couldn't come. My grandma couldn't come, my aunts couldn't come. Like everybody had gotten COVID. And yeah, my parents and, and I- and, and COVID didn't make it better. Either. No, <laughs> it and was... my parents and I hadn't spoken for a while. For quite some time, so it was like, them being the only ones that were gonna come to my graduation was like, I was like, <laughs> this is awful. <laughs> but it was what the pain was of like, this was 2020, 2022. 2022, okay. So it was like the pain of dealing with the fact that like, I didn't feel loved by anybody. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow's meant to be the best day of my life for the past four, like we'd finished the degree, but I felt like the lowest that I ever felt. And I remember sitting on my floor and just crying, like just sobbing. Um, nobody answered their phone. Like I called some of my friends, they didn't answer their phone. They were busy doing stuff. And I felt so alone. It was like, because the college had been cleared out, people had gone home. I hadn't gone home yet. So it was just me and like one other person in like the end of the hallway. And I was so lonely. Mm. And I felt that crushing weight of like, I have done all of this. You know, it's, look, a degree. Right. <laughs> like, I've done all of this and I'm still unlovable. Mm. And like, I was suicidal that night. Like I, I had some medication um, that is like stimulants um, for my ADHD. I didn't like them because they made my anxiety really bad, but I had, I kept the box. It was like, a, mm. but a few weeks before that, I'd given them to my best friend and I was like, hey, take them because I know that if I have a bad day, I'll pop them, I'll just pop them all, right? Mm. There's probably like, like 10 or 20 in the box. Um, and their stimulants, like they, your heart would race. Like they were like really powerful things. It was awful, I did not like them. And I remember in that moment on my floor, like sobbing my eyes out before graduation, thinking like, ah, thwarted by mm. two weeks ago, Rihanna. You know, like I, if I had those pills, I would have done it. I would have popped them all, I would have been, because there was no point in living. Like if I have done all this, if I have had, I've gone through everything. I've, I've written books, I've finished a degree, Tried like everything. I've traveled, yeah. I've, I've done all this stuff and I'm still unlovable. Like, why do I still keep going? Still not enough, yeah. What's the point of in, in continuing? Like mm. there's none. Mm. Mm. But I'm, I'm sure because you're here today that God protected you in he that did. moment. I mean, but there was no pills did. to pop. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, praise God. Um, praise the Lord, yeah. yeah. But now you see that that was an act of love 
uh, from God yeah. that he prevented that from happening. But it in was, that moment, it didn't you wouldn't feel connect. like it. You wouldn't connect. No, I was really that. angry. I didn't. Con- I, looking back, I can see that now. And like, there was another moment where, like, again, looking back, I could see God's hand in it. But mm-hmm. I had an issue with alcohol from like 22, 22, yeah, 21, 22. I started drinking because basically I didn't like my stimulants. Like I said, I didn't like my meds, meds for ADHD. Mm-hmm. I discovered that if I was a little bit tipsy, I could I could work, I could get stuff done, right? So obviously that was, uh, I don't have to say that was a slippery slope. <laughs> it's a slippery slope. It's right. alcohol, it's right. a drug. Mm-hmm. You can't medicate with alcohol. Like that's not, you know, yeah. anyways. But I remember one day, like this was like, it's been going on for like months and I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't, I was borderline an alcoholic, but I remember being, I was functional. Like I wasn't like, it wasn't like I had to drink to get through the day, mm-hmm. you know? I was a functional borderline alcoholic. But um, my friend, my best friend came into my room one day and he looked around and he was like, there's a lot of bottles. I remember being like, ooh, because like he wasn't somebody who would have cared about like drinking. Like he wasn't mm-hmm. anti-drink, he wasn't al- anti-alcohol. So but it just get alarmed. By it was it was amount. it was a real moment of like, yeah, this is a lot of bottles. Like mm-hmm. it really it really struck me. Like no, he's right. Like this is a lot of bottles, and I think that was and not even I think I know that was God's intervention at mm-hmm. that point because it didn't it didn't stop, but it got a lot better from that point onwards. Um, but that was a wake up moment. Like the same thing we were saying before. Like that was a moment of like. Yeah, no, this has to stop. This has to, something has to change. And I think it was a thing of like, something had to give, but I didn't know what, and I didn't know how. Mm. Because I still didn't have the love I was looking for. So it was like, what gives? How does it give? I don't know. Yeah, that, that, is, that is very true. And that is a difficult place to be yeah. where, yeah, you look at all the things that you've done to earn something and you still don't earn, earn it. Yeah. And you have spent a good chunk of your life trying to to prove and you still come out of that thing and with say, nothing you're still yeah, empty handed you, you're still empty handed and the thing I love about this story I say love but I don't mean I mean it in a tongue in cheek way everyone's focused on the wrong person mm-hmm. Jacob's focused on Rachel Rachel's focused on Leah Lee's focused on Jacob but none of them focused on God <laughs> like after she has Judah God is like, pff, like almost no return she, when she eventually comes back to God it says in verse 17 of chapter 30, um, and God listened to Leah. This is when she's like begging to have children again. And she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I have given my maid to my husband. So she calls his name Issachar. Then Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. So we see this tragedy of like the fall back Mm -hmm. to where she was, right? Like she figured it out. God be praised. She falls into this jealous moment with her sister and they end up having a spat. She has two sons. God's not even in the picture. And she comes back to God now. It's Mm -hmm. it's about Mm -hmm. God, but it's a twisted image of who God is. Right. God's blessed me because I gave my husband my maid. I've given him six sons. He has to love me. He's going to dwell with me or live with me now, right? And what I find interesting again here with the, the name for God is that it, it's Elohim. Mm-hmm. So she's picked up her sister's habits now. She had Jehovah and she's like, maybe Rachel's God is better than my God. Maybe whatever Rachel has going on for her works better than what I have going on for him because Jehovah, he loves me. Sure, 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 sure. But like, she seems to be loved a bit more by Jacob than I am. So maybe if I just be like her, I will be lovable. Mm. And I think... For me, that's where me and Leah diverge a little bit because Leah seeks to conform to be loved, but I sought to not conform because I was like, I don't, I can't keep working and earning. This is exhausting. Mm. Like I can't keep, so I was like, okay, you do your thing, God, I'll do my thing. I'm going to be who I feel like makes me feel the happiest and the most fulfilled and the most loved. Like I will Mm -hmm. look for love in places that in other places, because you're not giving me what I, I will look for it in relationships. I will look for it in careers. I will look for it in, in men, in women. I will look for it in whoever, right? Because you're not giving it to me. So I'll do my own thing. We right. can come back and mm-hmm. figure this out. Because when she comes back, like I said, it's, she says Elohim, right? She doesn't say Jehovah, she says Elohim. And 
that was me looking for, like that was around the time when I started to look into other spiritualities to be like, I need something. Mm. Like, I needed something to ground me religiously. Like I needed something to ground me like spiritually, mm -hmm. but that wasn't, it wasn't fulfilling either. Right, right. Like, so what you know? did you look into? If, well, if it was still... just like, it was kind of like the new age stuff, you know, the crystals, the tarot, whatever, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. meditation, um, burning candles, burning incense. Mm -hmm. And the thing about new age, the appeal of new age, I would say, is that it works. <laughs> like, and I don't mean that. I'm not trying to be like, guys, go, like, that's not what I'm saying. What I mean yeah, is that, like, I, I know what you mean. It's like, Satan, Satan, well, right? Satan has power. There's no reference in the Bible that he was stripped of the power right. that he has. Yeah. It's limited uh, to, it, to, to it, what he had, right. but it's still there. That's, right. that's what we often forget. Exactly. Because that's why he can deceive people like there's miracles that are yeah. happening because he the has... The pull is that like it works. Yeah. When you are appealing to spirits for answers, whatever spirit you're appealing to, you're going to get answers. Because if you're in a point where you're fragile and you're like looking for something else, mm -hmm. he is more than happy to offer you something else. He is more than happy to be like, oh, yeah. hey, 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 you don't want God? I got you. And so the, the pull of that was that it wasn't a very intense thing for me. It was a very light thing of like, you know, you just... You light some can not light some candles, you burn some incense, you meditate for a little bit, like you pray, but like kind of just vaguely to like higher beings. Mm -hmm. So it was all the like liturgy of like Christian Christianity without the like the weight of like that God, you know? Right. It was like the thing of like, I choose my God. Like I form my God. I believe in a specific kind of God, and that's who I want to worship. And or they a lot of options. Yeah, you there's you many options. What works exactly. For you. <laughs> or it's like God is the ultimate God, but there's like little spirits that kind of do his bidding in the meantime, because mm -hmm. then he can't deal with me. So they can deal with me. So I can speak to him through these things. Okay. Like I can feel his presence. And the thing is, like, I remember like whenever I felt stressed, mm -hmm. I'd come home, burn a candle, light some incense, say a prayer. I felt better. <laughs> like I genuinely felt better but so it was who, only who, thing of like pockets you, of peace who again are you praying to i don't even know you're just saying a prayer i would just say a prayer okay i would just say a prayer like the way that i've been taught to pray but mm -hmm. just like generically yeah so so i'm just i'm just curious to 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 hear from you how how that experience is like because you being raised a christian and adventist yeah. you'd start your prayer with like Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, yeah, Father. dear God, yeah, yeah exactly. right. So I'm just curious, how who were you directing the prayer to? And I don't think I was directing it to anyone. Honestly, like I think it was just a thing of like I would just start praying. Okay. Because I knew how to pray. Mm -hmm. I guess kind of the functions of it, rather than like the I knew the the formula, rather than like the function or the purpose of it. Uh -huh. But I didn't want to pray to God because I thought that I, I didn't think I could. Mm. It's like you don't want to hear from me now. Like right, it's, I've been away right, for so right, long, right? To, and to ask you for anything now would be which it would is, be almost like yeah, you know, it which would, is another deception of the enemy of because course. he led you to where you are, yeah. And now he he turns you around and say, look how far you are, yeah. <laughs> and then you're like ah, like and God and is not like, gonna like you now. And you're like guess we can't, guess we're here forever. And then yeah. you turn about around and keep walking. Exactly. Because you're like, well, there's no point in going back. You yeah. could keep, you could turn around and walk back, but the devil's really good at making us believe that God doesn't even want you back. Yeah. He's like, look at how far you are. Like, you haven't spoken to him for how many years? And now you want to ask him to, like, take care mm -hmm. of you? Mm -hmm. How audacious. Mm -hmm. And because my idea of love was still giving to get, if I'd given God no love, I couldn't ask for anything from him. Mm. I can't ask you anything. Like, mm. imagine, like, the friend you haven't spoken to for like seven years, right? Right. And you're visiting their country. Imagine calling them and being like, hey, can I stay with you? It's been seven years, bro. Like I haven't heard from you for seven years. Of course you can't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's how I saw God, right? Like it's been that long. And that's not what I would do with, with my friends. But like, that's how I think a lot of us think of like, you know, if you have somebody, haven't spoken to somebody for that long, you can't ask them for anything. And God, even more so, like he's busy. He has things to do. Like people are being, people are being way better than I am. People mm -hmm. are doing better than I am. People mm -hmm. are better people than I am. So if they're not asking, if they're asking for things and he's not answering them, why would he even answer me? 
Right, 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 right. right. So how, how did that phase last? You, you are meditating, looking for that all these like things. That was like a few months. It wasn't uh-huh. very long. It was a couple of months. And then my uncle died mm. in November. Sorry to hear about that. Yeah. yeah. And it was very like weird because it was the first death that close to me. I'd never lost anyone that close to me before. And dealing with death at 23 was like really weird. Because I didn't know what to do. Like, I didn't... We weren't very close when he died. Um, I didn't know how to process it. Mm. And so I fell back into old habits of drinking and, you know, doing drugs. Um, Because I was like, if I just don't... If I'm just not sober, I don't have to deal with any of this stuff. I don't have to deal with my emotions. Which is, again, another thing, right? Like, our ability to believe in God and trust in him is linked to our mental stability. Mm-hmm. And I had neither. <laughs> so I couldn't, I couldn't engage with spirituality. Um, yeah, I couldn't. And I remember, this is maybe a controversial thing to share, but I remember, so I used to do at the beginning and the end of every month, I would do like tarot card readings, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember at the end of the year, this was like December, I did about three readings like in succession, like three days in a row. And every single day I pulled this specific card and I was like, this doesn't make any sense because like I wasn't great at tarot readings. Like I wasn't like an expert. I didn't know how to do them very well. I was kind of like figuring it out, vibing it or whatever. Okay. But there was, a, there was this one card I kept pulling and what it means is like your life will be flipped upside down, like destruction, chaos, like ruin. The first day I was like, oh, I probably pulled it wrong, you know? Mm-hmm. Second day I was like, again. Third day I was like, the, something's coming. <laughs> something's mm. coming. So it kept on being consistent. Yeah, it was three days in a row of me putting this specific card. Mm-hmm. And now I'm not saying that God uses tarot to talk to us. Right. What I am saying he can is that he reaches through our darkness mm-hmm. because he's not scared of darkness, because he is God. And so I remember, like after, I mean, I'll explain what happened afterwards, but that experience, I know, I know it was God being like, buckle up. Because if I hadn't had that card three times in a row at the end of that year, what would have happened afterwards would have, I would have been caught so unawares that I would have, I don't know what would have happened to me, mm-hmm. sincerely. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the big moment where I meet God. So January, New Year's, go to a party. I'm like, it's fine, but I'm not happy. I'm kind of empty. This is home. 2023. 2023, mm-hmm. yeah. The following week, go to another party. Like, it's going to be drugs there. I'm going to get high. I just want to be sober again. Like, I just don't have to deal with what's going on right now. So I go to this party. I do a stupid high dose and I have to go home on my own on the train, right? Um, and I have the worst trip ever. Like it, it, the dose was, was, it was just really stupidly high. I wasn't thinking because I wasn't able to, to correct my own. Like I had no sense of inhibitions. Like I was mm. just like, I just want to be gone, right? Right. But the train ride home, which is like also like normal people hours, like it's like normal, like 7, 8 p.m. on like a Sabbath, mind you. So I'm like high on a Sabbath, Mm. Um, normal people hours. And um, I'm out of my mind on this train home. And I hear the voices of everybody who has ever lived, is living and will ever live. And they're telling me, this is it. This is it. This is it. And it wasn't that calm. It was terrifying. It was like over and over repeated, like Mm. frantic, like louder and louder and louder. Like it was really scary. Scary isn't even the word to begin. Like there's not even human language to describe the fear that I felt in that moment. The fear that you felt. Because I felt in that moment, I was so sure I was going to burn in hell. (laughs) Like I was like, if this is it, and this is the sum of my life, like I'm not, I'm not making it. I'm not making it. Right. So this is it. Did it mean like, hey, you're going to die. You're not going to make If you don't make it, then everything is gone. I think it was. 
ambiguous enough to cause that kind of fear. Okay. I didn't okay. know what it meant, but for me, it was like, this is the end of your life. This is the end. This is the last moment you're going to be, you know, breathing and conscious and alive. Mm -hmm. And so it was terrifying because I was like, I'm not ready to die. Mm. I, I haven't even done enough good things to die. Like mm. I haven't, if I have to stand before the throne of God now, <laughs> it's a wrap. Like, I know where I'm going. Right. And that was scary because it was like the first time I've ever faced the reality of hell. Like, um, in terms of like punitive punishment of like, you haven't done enough stuff, you're gonna mm -hmm. burn in hell. And I remember like, my view of hell shifted a lot from childhood to that point. Like as a kid, I was telling all my friends like, guys, hell isn't even a real place, you know? Like scripturally, hell isn't even a place that you burn forever. Right. And then in university, it was like, uh, hell's probably real, like probably gonna go there if I die. But I wasn't thinking about what would happen if I died in that moment. It was like, in the if moment. I die like yeah. in the future, you know, like if I die when I'm like 70. Yeah, I still have I've a lived lot a good of time. Life, uh, yeah. But, you know, I don't wanna be with God because he's not loving, mm -hmm. right? But in that moment I was like, no, 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 no. Like, it's real, not a place, but it's it, the concept of hell, being, going to hell, <laughs> not making it to heaven real. is real. Right. And if that is real, then heaven is real. And I wanna be there instead. And there was this just abject fear of like, my life is over, my brain is broken, and being tormented by these thoughts, these spirits, these um, intrusive thoughts that just kept coming. You're gonna die, you're gonna die. Mm. What if the train explodes? What if the car blows up? What if, just all these awful things of like, I saw death everywhere. Like I'd be walking, mm. I see a stranger, I'd be scared they were gonna stab me. I would be crossing the road, I scared a car's gonna come out and like hit me. Like I was terrified, you were terrified. of everything and mm. of dying. I want to highlight something that is very interesting that you mentioned there, that at this point, you now felt like you wanna be in heaven, you don't wanna be in hell, yeah. which is a little bit different I don't know if we we have mentioned it today, but when you were sharing with me um, your story, that at some point you felt like I don't want to be in heaven with a God that I'm, that is distant, with a God that yeah that didn't have love. But at this point, yeah. even though you had not turned the corner yet, I was like, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to die. <laughs> you don't want to die. die. And at the same time, you're like, I want to be there. I want to yeah. be in heaven, which is like the first steps of God leading you yeah. like, and back I think, to the love. I think the thing we were talking about, like giving to get, like my motivation mm -hmm. was entirely selfish. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to die. Like that was my reason exactly. for, for, for trying exactly. to, like I cried out to God because I didn't want to die. I didn't know who else to call out to. Obviously when you're in the depth of your, mm -hmm. your chaos, your mess, your darkness, like the only thing you can call out to is God. Yeah. And yeah. my reasoning was selfish. Like it was. I yeah. don't want to die. But even though it was selfish, it was the beginning of uh, of of the steps of God well, leading you to point. where you, you went. The you point needed is to that be. even though I didn't give God love, mm -hmm. he still gave me love. That's right. I gave him self and mm. he gave me salvation. There you are. There, there you go. Because uh, previously when you were in your room the night before graduation, yeah. of course you were suicidal. You're like, I don't have any reason right. to leave. But now you're saying, I don't want to die. I don't want to die, right. Yeah. Because well, it, wasn't, it wasn't at my hands. It, I wasn't in control. I think the thing about like dying at your own hands is that like, I choose this. Mm. I'm in control. Mm -hmm. But when there's forces around you that you can't control that are swarming you, harassing right. you, like I right. could not, right. for three months after that um, moment, I couldn't function. Like I couldn't go out. I couldn't, I, the, like the high wore off, but like, I thought I had lost my mind. I thought I was going insane. Um, and that kind of fear, like, <laughs> you can't function with that, right? Mm -hmm. But God, God was like, even though the reason that you turned to me was selfish, mm -hmm. I love you. Like, I want you to be alive. I want you to be well. And I want you to feel, not that you have to have control, but that I am in control. Really. Right, 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 right. So in that in that uh, in that space of time, uh, fear of course is related to anxiety. So did you struggle with anxiety? Yeah, that time? I struggle with anxiety and depression, like the, the classic mental illnesses, for like most of my life, from like thirteen uh -huh. um, onwards. Um, but yeah, it was that three months was just terrifying. Was just terrifying. So how yeah. did you how did you get out of it? So this is the really exciting part that I love talking about. 
Praise the Lord. Um, but I was doing a devotion. It was March. Mm-hmm. And in the Bible app, because I was after my, so in my, in my fear, in my like, oh, what do I do? My instinct was what, what, what to do, like works. I'm going to prove to God that I can, I can work my way out of this kind of like hell list and get to heaven, right? Mm-hmm. That was like the thing of like, I'll just work hard. Like I'll pray, I'll read my Bible, I'll do my devotion. Like I'll do whatever you need me to do to prove to you that I can be good. Like I can mm-hmm. earn this, I can earn this, right? So I'm reading and reading and for months, like and nothing's really like making me feel better. Like I feel like I'm doing the right thing, but I don't feel any better. Like I feel moments of peace, but I'm like, I don't feel any better. Anyway, so like, I don't even feel any closer to heaven basically. Mm-hmm. So I eventually am doing this devotion this March, mid of March, um, doing this devotion. And the verse of the day is um, for all who call, call, call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Mm. That's, like, a, okay. that's a powerful verse. It's a yeah. powerful verse because it's a promise mm-hmm. and it's, it's a universal one. All, not some, not those who aren't selfish, all, which included me, right? Right, right. <laughs> I call right. upon the name of the Lord. That's the condition. Call on his name. You'll be saved. So I read that and I was like, okay, okay. And then in the, the text for the devotion, um, the, the devotional text that they wrote was the verse quoted Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And the amazing thing about this for me was the fact that like, it didn't quote the verses. It mm-hmm. had it in brackets, mm-hmm. right? It had like a, a comment, I don't remember what it was, and it had that this reference in brackets. And I never look up bracket verses. I'm just like, if you, it was that important, you'd put it in there, right? If right, it was that important, right, you'd just right, write it. Right. But for whatever reason, I opened my Bible to this verse and it reads, this is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace, oh, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And I don't know what happened, right? It was the 17th of March. I don't know what happened, but something clicked in my mind and something just was like, it was obviously the Holy Spirit, right? And it was like, he was saying to me, Rihanna, stop working. Mm. I have done it all for you. Like mm. stop trying to earn my love or salvation. You can't earn either of them, mm. but they are there. They are yours if you believe they are yours, right? Right. And it just changed my life. Like the things I was talking about and the verses I'd read and all the songs I've been singing since I was a child, like everything made sense. Every All the songs made sense. All the verses made sense. All the, John 3.16 was real to me in a way that it never had been mm. like we repeat that all the time right right but it became it, i was like oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. was being serious that's, he that's, wasn't joking that's, that's right it's interesting that you say that because this past week i did a chapel uh at our school and i was telling them though this verse is said a lot of times that it has become a common verse this yeah. is one of the most powerful verses it's in so the Bible. powerful yeah oh my goodness it's so powerful and we have made it so so common that so it, we just stripped it yeah we've yeah. We've, we've stripped it of everything mm-hmm. um we've added in like parentheses like you know or who believe in me and do good works. <laughs> you know, we, we add that. We don't realize we put it in, but we yeah. put it in, we penciled it in, mm-hmm. you know? So it's not as powerful as it could be because we've lost the focus of it, which is Christ. We've right, lost the cross right, of Christ. Right, right. And I think that was the thing, like the, the word of God is like Paul says, it's, it's powerful. It's a two edged sword, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's mighty. It's living, it's breathing, it's real. And, the passage itself, I mean, it's just words on a page, but it's the words that God spoke on a page mm-hmm. that mean that they had the same life-giving power that created the world, right? Like the, that quickened life, that breathed life right. into our nostrils. Like it's the same, this word is the word that spoke. Mm-hmm. Like the, we're here because of this word, right? But for me, what that passage did, because it pointed me to John three sixteen. Right, like even though I wasn't thinking about John three sixteen, Ephesians two eight and nine pointed me to John three sixteen. What is John three sixteen? It's Jesus saying, "I will die, mm. I will rise, exactly, I will triumph." Yeah. And I think the point is that we forget sometimes that every single line, every single passage in this book 
points us to Jesus. He says to Nicodemus, if I be lifted up, mm. I will draw all men unto me. All men into it's me. not yeah. if I and something, if I, no, if Jesus himself, if, if the simplicity of the cross of the gospel, which is the gospel, is lifted up, that will be the thing that draws the people onto him. Like it wasn't the years I'd had of doctrine mm. and of theological discussions and debates and scholarship. Like that's great and it has its place, but that is not what draws people to Christ. That is not what pulls people. Like it might be a thing of like peaking interest, but what draws us to Christ is lifting him up. That's right. Because he's the one that is going to transform people. Right. So if we lift up works, then people are going to be in that position where you, you, you were but before. where I was, right. Yeah, like, hey, I've done all these things, but I'm still not good enough. Right. And, you know, at the end, I was actually thinking about this. Like, Jesus gives that, uh, that, that picture of the end time. Like, people will come to me and say, we've done this in your name. Right. But I'm going to say... Says, and that's the thing. Like, that's powerful because he says, like, I don't know you. Exactly. And that word mm -hmm. is... is that's the key to the verse. I never got that verse either. I was like, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> but they're doing these things in your name. Like, what do you mean you don't know them? Jesus says that the eternal the life mm -hmm. is knowing him. Exactly. So that's intimacy. Yeah. That's that, that's that relationship. That's that friendship. That's that love, mm. right? Like knowing him. And so we can do things in people's names and not know who they are. Exactly. People have yeah. people. That's like the history of like, of most of like medieval and early modern Europe, like people being like, this is in the name of God. No, it's not. But because of what you put out of him, that's how people perceive him to be. If right. you kill people in the name of God and they don't know who God is, that's who God is. Yeah. God is a murderer. Ex exactly. He's a genocide. <laughs> like he, yeah. he's a war criminal, mm -hmm. you know? And that, that's the point. It's like, you can, we can do so much good and bad in the name of Jesus. That doesn't mean that, it, that he knows us. Yeah, it's not connected to him. Right. So at that, at that point, you realize this core principle of the gospel yes. of saying, hey, I cannot do anything to earn it. It was the love I had been looking for. Mm. And I'm going to like jump to the end of Leah's story because I think I wanted to like just tie that bit in the last part. I think that was like a perfect segue. Mm -hmm. So after Rachel dies... Leah isn't mentioned again. And I was like, that's so sad. Like her sister dies, she's not mentioned again. And I was sharing all this, this, this whole story and this, the journey with my friend, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm gonna jump to the end. Because, so anyway, we looked for her in um, the Bible again, in Spirit of Prophecy. And she appears again in chapter 40, is it 49? 49 where Jacob dies. Um, and I'll read this. And so it seems unrelated, but it is, I promise it's really powerful. Mm -hmm. So it says, 29, then he changed, then he charged them and said to them, I am to be gathered to my people, mm -hmm. bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the now, field yeah. of Ephron the Hittite, mm -hmm. in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite as a possession for a burial place. 31, there they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife, that they buried Isaac and Rebecca, his wife, and there I buried Leah. Mm. And I was like, oh my <laughs> goodness. Like Leah, so I was reading in Spirit Prophecy about this whole thing, right? Remember how Jacob is, um, he's meant to have the blessing, the birthright. Yeah, but he's exactly. With the right to see. Mm -hmm. It was God's plan for him to have it, but not the way that he gained it, right? That's true. Yeah. When we look at Leah and Rachel and their characters, Leah is by far a more godly, sturdy, and reliable woman. That's by right. By far, mm -hmm. right? She knows God. She says Jehovah, we see that, right? Mm -hmm. She knows God. She's not petty and petulant like her sister is. Like, oh, I won. Like, I had a baby. Like, I won over my sister. She, she's firm. She's a good, godly woman. Ra Jacob likes Rachel because he sees her and he's like, she's beautiful. Mm -hmm. She's gorgeous, right? So he likes her not because he's asked god for permission but because he wants to marry rachel but in the deceit it's similar to the thing of like rachel and jacob and Esau because jacob got what he was meant to have through the wrong means and that caused cost him everything right mm -hmm. leah we can read in this in this story she was the intended wife of jacob 
God meant for Leah to marry Jacob, not the way she did it, but she was going to be the woman through whom he blessed Jacob because Jacob had a promise that he was going to be blessed, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Leah has Levi and Judah, mm -hmm. the two tribes that, that are like the so foundation essential. of everything. Mm -hmm. Leah has them, not Rachel, Leah, because God gave them to her because God's plan was always to bless Jacob through Leah. Mm. And the mess that happened because Jacob could have married Leah and been like, you know what? Not ideal because they were they were um, monogamous, right? Like he'd seen what happens with Abraham and Hagar, right? right? He'd seen right, the right, the impact right. of having two wives. Mm -hmm. He chose to add that to himself. He added the mess of Rachel. That wasn't God. That was Jacob mm -hmm. added the mess of Rachel. He could have just been like, you know what, God, fine, not pleased, but whatever. But here, at the end of her life, after she's even gone, at the end of his life, we see what God always intended. Leah was his lawful wife in the eyes of God because Rachel died first, right? She was buried um, on the road to somewhere. I don't remember where it was. But Leah is in the burial place where all where the, the, the fathers the and their wives are. Right. According right, to God. Right, because right. Jacob recognizes that like, yeah, I did whatever. I loved Rachel. But Leah was my lawful wife. Mm -hmm. In the eyes of God, she was my wife. And it was this moment of like mind-blowing, like, like seeing how after her death, Leah was able to realize, not even she was able to realize, I can realize in this story, how blessed she was. Right. Mm -hmm. She had Levi, the priests, Judah, the scepter, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Even if she'd had, no, even if she'd only had those four kids, and no, it wouldn't have mattered. She had Levi and Judah. She had the yeah, two tribes. Yeah, and that was tribes. the lineage of Jesus. Exactly. Yeah. That was mm -hmm. the, the, the two types of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Prophet and king, right? Priest and king, sorry. And so we have this like image of Leah, like in her life, she searched so much to find a love that she wanted from Jacob. But in her death, we see that the love that she got from God was so much greater than the love that mm -hmm. she could have gotten from Jacob. Like she got... Levi and Judah, those two tribes, she was legally recognized as the wife of Jacob oh, in his burial of, of her, yeah. right? And she was loved in a way that Rachel in the story by God wasn't loved the same way. Like she was loved in a special way. He blessed her. He opened her womb. He saw her. He heard her, right? Mm -hmm. Because Rachel was loved by Jacob. She had the love that she needed, right? And God loved her too. God loves all of us equally. But God loved Leah, like he loved Leah. And I think it was so symbolic for me of seeing after, like I was re-baptized re in May, right? Mm -hmm. And it was the thing of like, after my death, I saw how blessed I was and how loved I was. Oh, praise the Lord. After the I Lord. was buried in Christ, mm -hmm. I saw the whole time that he loved me so much. And the love that I was searching desperately for was right in front of my eyes. But I had been ignoring it. Because I wanted something else. I wanted this, yeah. I wanted that. But like, it was like, that was the love that, you know what I mean? And Satan blinds people of course. from seeing that love. Because, because he that, makes, right. Like yeah. seeing the cross. Mm -hmm. if, if we see the cross and it says that we, when we, uh, he's lifted up, we'll be drawn onto him. When we see that, mm -hmm. it brings us closer to Christ. So if we can't see the cross and his love, then we're stuck where we are, right? Yeah. What shows us God's love is the cross. That's true. What makes me believe his love? Because I, I knew it was there, mm -hmm. but I didn't like it. I thought it was what I saw as love, right? But when you see the cross, your view of love has to shift. Mm. Because do you know how much you have to love somebody? Paul says it, right? That anybody, somebody might die for a righteous man, maybe somebody for a good man. But for when we were yet sinners, sinners. he died, died for, for us. us. And the love that it requires to mm -hmm. leave everything, come to earth, live and die as a human, die on a cross, which the thing is like, we don't have the cultural context for that now anymore that makes it so visceral, but the cross was an ugly thing. Mm -hmm. It was the worst of the worst of the worst. Like if you were a Roman citizen, you wouldn't be crucified. It was so ugly that it was like saved for like non-Roman races. You were not, the cross was such a symbol of shame and disgrace, right? Mm. It was ugly. It was awful. And you, the creator of the universe, the author of Went life. through that. Yeah, exactly. Get on a cross willingly. You are nailed you. to the cross. You are naked. You are humiliated. Mm -hmm. You are beaten up. You are spat on. 
you are kicked, you are shamed, you are mocked. They say, if you're the son of God, come down, come down, come mm-hmm. down, mm-hmm. right? Like you are tempted because that come down, Ellen White talks about it was like, that was the devil and his angels tempting Jesus to come down because they knew if he sat up there, it was a wrap for them, right? That's right. And That's he, right. He, he couldn't feel his father's presence because he had, he became sin for us. He couldn't even feel his father. That is powerful. Like, and in that moment of his deepest torment, the devil saying, come down, come down, come down. Yeah. Right. And he didn't, he, I like, I like that verse. He didn't commit sin. No, he, he became, became sin. sin he became us. sin for us. And I like what you said uh, yesterday when we were visiting that you cannot out sin grace. No. Because that level of love goes beyond. And we That's what I'm saying. That, that, the picture of the cross. The mm-hmm. pi- like we talk about the cross, the cross, the cross. No, no, no. Think about it. Think about the picture of the cross. Like he is hanging there. He is dying. He is mocked. And with his dying breath, what does he say? Father, forgive Father, them. Father, forgive them. Forgive. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah. His dying breath is a prayer of forgiveness for the people who are killing him. Not just killing him, mocking him, abusing him, right? His... His, his dying thought is for his murderers. Yeah. And, you know, we may be thinking that, oh, he was just saying that because he's Jesus. Right. right. But he meant it because in Acts chapter 2, we see the same people being appealed to yeah. by Peter. And they actually repented. Yeah. They actually took advantage of the cross. Of course, the rest of the Jews, um, the, the Pharisees and the, the leaders of the Jewish nation, they... They didn't take advantage of the cross. You see it in Acts chapter 4 yeah. when they started uh, persecuting the church. But the multitudes that were there in Acts chapter 2, they realized because Peter actually told them that this is the son of God that he crucified. Mm-hmm. And they were moved to it. And they said, what can because we do? That's what it is. It's that <laughs> what thing can we like, do? And he said, no, you cannot do anything. That's what Repent. it is. It's, that's what it is. You don't do anything. Just accept it. Yeah. Accept that he did that for you. Accept that there's, this, there's the phrase that's like, before you accept that the cross was done for you, mm-hmm. you have to accept that it was done by you. Right. And right, seeing right. Christ on the cross after all my mess, after all my chaos and drama and whatever, like after rejecting him for all those years, seeing that love, that graphic love, like I saw his eyes as he was dying. He was looking at me and it wasn't anger or hurt. It was, it was love. complete love. Mm. I have never seen love like that in my life. Mm. And I was like, if that is love, I want to serve that God. If that Praise is love, Lord. I want to be with that God. Amen. Amen. If Praise that is Lord. love, I want to tell everybody about that love because like we said at the beginning, our idea of love is so twisted. It's so warped. It's so fake. It's what we see in movies and in what we read in books and what we experience from our families and friends and people who don't treat us or the men to treat us. That's mm-hmm. not love. The cross is love. And so the things that we are looking for are in the cross. The love we're looking for, the belonging, the peace, the community, like that's in Christ. It's in the figure of the cross. That's what it is. That's what transforms. Right, right. That is wonderful. So as we wrap up here, um, if there's anyone who is in the same situation as you are, or in that journey, it's not like an event, might be a process. Yeah. What words of encouragement will you say to this person? Well, just, it, is a, it is a process. Like we said, yeah. like with Leah, it's mm-hmm. not a thing of like, you just believe it and then you can kind of keep believing it. It's that yeah. every day Christ will romance you. Mm-hmm. Every day he will woo you so that you see that his love will never change. Mm. There is nothing that you can do to earn the love of God. Um, and it might sound terrifying, but it's free. Mm. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to... There's nothing you can do to make him love you more or love you less. You can't earn his love more and you can't lose his love by what you do. Mm -hmm. Because the cross that was done for you is eternal. It's forever. Like his grace is sufficient for you. Mm -hmm. And I didn't believe that. I didn't really think that. But like his grace is sufficient. Like you said, you can never be more than a sinner than Christ is a savior. Right, right. You can't out sin his grace. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you cannot ever be beyond you could sin from birth to death and still not have out sinned his grace right right and we have this idea that like our sins have a cap it's like this small and then beyond that it's like you're on your own christ's 
death covers everything, everything. And the devil's biggest deceit is that his death can't cover you. Okay. It can cover them, sure. It can cover him, sure. Mm -hmm. It can't cover you. But the gospel says that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It says that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So the word of God says otherwise. Mm. Amen. Amen. And what would you say to a parent that has a young person that might be going through the same experiences? I think it's really easy as parents to, I'm not a parent, but parents, mm -hmm. to look at our behaviors and be like, oh, my kid's doing this thing. Like he's, I don't know, drinking or like she's doing drugs or like they're doing this, they're partying. That isn't the problem. That's a behavior. It's a manifestation of the problem. It's a the fruit. problem at the core of it is what you have to get to. It's like what we all want as human beings, it looks different for all of us, but we all are looking for something. Love, acceptance, affirmation, which I guess all come under the umbrella of love, right? Mm -hmm. The erection, purpose, whatever it is we're looking for, at the root of that searching is Jesus. It's Christ, it's God, it's peace, it's love. Are you being the peaceful stability that they need? Are you, are you showing them the things that Christ would show to you in your own mess of the same thing? Because the more we seek to be like Christ, the more that we emulate him, mm -hmm is the more that we, it says, like he says, that he is joining, drawing us to him. Mm. When you lift up Christ, it will draw people to him. It, Amen. It, it's, it, Amen. it will. Amen. So the solution for parents is not to, you know, try and target these behaviors of your children or like get them help for these things. Yes, obviously, like absolutely. But the core of it is, are you showing them who Christ is? Is mm. your behavior demonstrating mm -hmm. the cross? Mm -hmm. Can they see the love of Christ in how you treat them. Amen. Amen. That is powerful. That is powerful. Praise God. And thank you so much. We could talk the whole day. <laughs> because <laughs> we shouldn't. This, this, yeah. <laughs> these, are, these are very important uh, yeah. principles. And this is the core of the gospel. So yeah. exploring it will never... We, we, never, we can yeah. never understate the importance Exa of the cross. Ex exactly. Like and we can't. We can, it's we, it's we, the gospel. And the beauty of the gospel is the more you study it, the more you... Uh, you peel out so many layers. Right, like, there's so much. Wow, wow, you can keep going. There's so so much. I, I, I enjoyed uh, this uh, this discussion and you sharing your testimony and the angle that you have come um, it at, uh, like weaving the, in the, into the story of Leah and yeah. bringing the gospel because these stories, they're not just cool Bible stories for they're the for kids. Our, they're for us. They're for <laughs> us so that we can be able to glean that right. these were human beings that struggled with real issues real. and this is how God helped them and we can be able to do the same as well Amen. and implement this, these things in our lives. There you have it, friends. I hope you were blessed by this episode as much as I was. If you were, Please remember to share this episode with your loved ones, your friends, and your families. And don't forget to subscribe, follow, like, and leave us a comment. Until next time, Maranatha.